Good morning. This is Steve from Southern Illinois. And um, it's a beautiful fall day here, nice and sunny. But I've enjoyed it, in, invited Bobby Gage to join us again. Thank you. How have you been doing, Bobby? Oh, having some fun times and going out doing different things like you know. Been out droning some. Got it. You started us out on this GPS gospel thing with your uh, demonstration of droning and uh, discussion of the GPS system. Yeah. I asked yeah, you to come yeah. back today because uh, you mentioned to me that there are things that can degrade your GPS system functioning. And I, I just wanted you to talk about that because I think there are some analogies that might be helpful as we're examining spiritual guidance here. Definitely. Definitely are. Um, some of the things over the years um, I've learned how we can definitely have a lot of things interfere with our walk with Christ. And the uh, droning is no different, for sure. Um, I, I sent you a video I want you to show, but before you show, I want to give you a little introduction uh, to a couple things. Uh, there's typically two types of uh, hobbyist, enjoyable droning type thing people do. Uh, one is called FPV, that's a first person view. Those are the ones, if you watch on YouTube, people will be wearing goggles. They'll put the goggles on and they actually see the camera of their drone and they typically will call it a quad, um, in the lenses of their, of their um, goggles that they have on. And that gives them a first-person view of the camera. And they fly all over the place, up, down, right, left. Um, unlike my drone, where almost always the horizon is level and flat, and I can't make it really do sideways or straight down, they can. And the reason they do that is they don't have a control system in place like I do in mine. It doesn't have a GPS. Mm. Whereas on mine, a GPS helps to make sure it stays solid and it's still right there so I can take a good photograph. Mm -hmm. Theirs are for racing. So they don't want that stuff limiting them so that way they can fly around differently. So basically, so, they're like a, a jet pilot up there in the sky uh, doing yeah. their loops. and. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. Unlike commercial jetliner, which you would never want to do that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I sent a video to you, Steve, and go ahead and start playing it there if you want. Okay. Uh, but you'll notice a unique condition. I'm flying in woods. And if you go on YouTube and watch most uh, drone videos, you will notice they're not flying in woods. Typically, there's nothing really above them. And the reason that is, is because of interference, the, the trees are interfering. And if you notice as I'm flying through here, I'll wander to one side, I'll wander to the other side, and I don't have that stability, as much stability as I would when I'm out and away from, away from things like that. I'm glad you mentioned that because I thought you were just, you know, kind of drunk and lazily going down the trail. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm having to do a lot of compensation. And then once I get out here, then the uh, it gets easier then because you don't have that, that tree line overhead. Hmm. And if you'll notice as I spin around here and, do, and fly around, I'm actually setting up for another shot of going down and um, trying to get a, a shot from this little tree. And one of the things I got to be careful of because I am in the in the woods down there is I don't want to turn off the drone because it has a lock on the satellites. And if I was to turn it off and walk into the woods, as you see me there practically running, <laughs> because uh, and turn it back on, um, I would have lost the signal. So I actually left it on the entire time. And you'll notice now I'm trying to set up. I'm speeding ahead there, and, and I've got this brilliant idea. I'm going to go hide in the woods when you see me. <laughs> video. <laughs> I'm not running that fast in real life at all. You need some cam camo boots and, uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. pants. Lack. <laughs> yeah, lacking a bit there. So there's a tree I'm trying, trying to lock onto. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to pull away. And as you'll notice, there's a couple trees behind me. And as I pull away, I want to go between the trees and fly back. Now, my drone creates a lot of wind. So you'll see that in the trees. But you will also notice some inherent movement of of the leaves and what's happening is not only am i 
battling the interference of the GPS signal, but I'm also battling some elements of, of nature, and that is the wind conditions. So I'm really trying to get this line up, and as I pull back, uh, you'll notice I don't get too much past the trees. That's because once I pass that tree barrier, I'm now hitting the wind outside of that. And no, I'm really close on the left, especially. Um, and see, I'm getting tossed around there from the wind. And that's the challenge, the challenge that I'm having there. And typically with a GPS drone, you don't have it. The challenge is the wind, but because we're in a lower accuracy condition, and then I bring it back in. I say, all right, can I compensate for this? Am I going to be able to handle this? And you notice I can't. So I'm I'm anchoring on that tree. You notice I'm moving to the left or moving to the right slowly away. I'm not controlling doing that. Is doing that on its own. Hmm. So those are some of the challenges I'm having by having interference. Okay. So you've talked you've talked about um, the first person vision, the FPV drones that have no GPS stabilization okay. system um, as compared to what you're doing, but then you have interference from objects that can block the signal mm -hmm. and interference from the wind blowing you around. Yep, and combined together, it creates it more difficult to get the, the picture or image I'm wanting to get. Got it, That's got it. challenges there. Uh, another place um, that I was wanting to bring up was geocaching. Uh, so go ahead and bring that slide up. Geocaching I got into many years back. I got into this before smartphones even existed. Um, and basically online, uh, they post these coordinates and all these hidden treasures. And that's how I always first looked at it. And every green dot is a hidden geocache there. And basically what it is, go ahead and go to the next slide, Steve. And there's a little box that you will see uh, has some uh, trinkets in it. And I love uh, Rubik's Cube. So there's a little Rubik's Cube there. So if I was to find this geocache, I'd probably trade out, put a trinket in there, and I would take a Rubik's Cube or something like that. And it's just a cool little activity. And... Typically, people hide them. So they're hidden sometimes easier, sometimes more difficult. If you go to the next slide, you notice that it's hidden fairly easily. It's behind, underneath it, some tree or log, but it's not overly covert. Uh, if you're in the area walking around trying to find it, you'll probably see it. Uh, and go ahead and go to our next slide. You'll notice one a little more difficult to find. And not only that, a little more difficult to get through uh, with a, some type of thorn plant there in between. But you know, the person getting to this probably is having to climb around some rocks to hunt for this and and so forth. And not only that, you don't even really know what's in it. You don't even really know what the prize is going to be until you get to it. And half the time, they're soggy and wet, so it's not that that beneficial as the one you saw there. So what's the challenge here? You just plug in the GPS coordinates and it takes you directly to the box. What's the challenge that you're facing? Yeah, if you go to our next slide, you'll see here the... Uh, the coordinates are shown there. Uh, and what's so interesting is you punch those in your phone or you use an app and it takes you there. The app tick typically will also tell you a plus minus value. A plus minus value is telling you the accuracy of, of your current GPS information. So it might get all the way down to plus minus 12 feet, plus minus 20 feet or whatever it may be. That means that is telling you you're here. So I can literally be standing directly on top of that GPS corn exactly, yet the geocache is not there. Why? It is possible that's behind me 12 feet or in front of me 12 feet. So that means I have to look around. Yeah, I know a good idea where it is, but it's not exactly where it is uh, because of that error. Uh, now it's interesting to help compensate this. Oh, let me show you the next slide first. Go to the next slide. So you can see that some of the challenges you run into. So, okay, here's one actually place that that geocache we we're just looking at the name uh, and, and that location actually leads you straight to this tree. And me and a group of Southern Illinois youth actually placed a geocache in the base of this tree. And we what we did is we, I found it. I cleaned out the little debris there. And there's a little hollow area. Put the little box of trinkets in there and covered up a few pieces of bark. So it was a challenge to find it. Mm -hmm. And 
that's the enjoyment of it. Since it's not 100% accurate, you have to hunt around for it. Okay, so let me wrap my head around this. Say it's uh, minus, plus or minus 25 feet. Uh, that means that you, on your phone, the actual position could be at a negative 25 feet versus the coordinates. If I come with my phone, if it's plus or minus 25 feet, I might be at a plus 25 feet. For the yeah, extreme to extreme. Yep. So that's the, the, a possibility that we're going to be 100, 100 feet apart. Uh, more like 50. 50? 50, yeah, yeah you had the right 50, idea. Yeah. 50 feet apart. Yeah. So how in the world do you find something when it's so well hidden like this? Well, that that's the enjoyment of it. Uh, some people enjoy just simply going off the coordinates. Uh, and a little notes, as you saw there. But uh, also on the website, if you continue to scroll down, uh, there's often a little hint there. And it's, it's, in, it's hidden. Uh, you have to hit a button that says decrypt. So that way you just can't breeze through it and inadvertently read it. Um, but when you do read it, oftentimes it'll give you more, of a, more, more information. For example, I might be at an oak tree looking around an oak tree, and, and a hint says pine tree. Oh, wait a minute. There's a pine tree over there. So it gives you helps you out a little bit more. Okay, it gives you another layer to it if you want to want to. Okay, cheat so like you, you you've got uh, two systems of orientation, um, the the clues plus the GPS yep. thing. So okay, yep. and you know back to uh, the initial thought, all this you're led astray in different ways. You know, you're led astray by the atmosphere conditions, whether it is an overcast day can decrease that level on your phone. Okay. Uh, the uh, trees, like we've already mentioned, but you can also have other things, you know, like the rocks, the stony area, like that one geocache we saw was down those, that rocky area. And you would have to climb up and get over to actually get into that. You know, is that worth my effort to do that? Or, yeah, the GPS says it could be up there, but it may not be. You know, you may go through all that trouble, and it's actually not there. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I appreciate you coming and introducing another aspect of droning. I had heard of geocaching, but I hadn't realized that uh, it had developed so much now that we have cell phones and apps and the like. So. Yep, they got it all. Okay. Um, well, what analogies uh, do you find in your own life, Bobby, between what we've been talking here about signal degradation and obstacles and interference and your spiritual life? You know, I think that typically our day-to-day -day life uh, that we all go through, we don't think about how things are working on the back end, you know. We might have our cell phone and we punch in, I want to go to here, and we drive, just do what it says, and it gets us there. Yet there's a lot of things behind making that happen. And, you know, sure, I'm a Christian. And at times I think we just leave it there. We, we don't uh, dig much deeper than that, you know. And ultimately similar, you know, things get in our way, you know, and next thing we know, we might be led astray or getting in some hurdles that we're not expecting to get into mm -hmm. uh, because of that. And to me, I, I've kind of correlated those two some. Okay. Yeah, I, I can relate to that. One of the um, one of the difficulties that I have in my spiritual life that produces a disconnect uh, is the cultural overlay or the cultural environment and the influence that has on me. And I know Christians like to like to talk about atheism and, or secularism, and that's the big bugaboo. Uh, but while those competing worldviews do have an impact on me, I struggle more with a disconnect due to rationalism uh, you know, for the last 300 years, Western culture has emphasized the use of logic and, and rational thought processes for problem solving. And I find myself as a Christian, that's that's the way I approach life. And I don't even see that as a conflict with Christianity. Right. Um, we've, we've almost built that into Christianity in terms of the use of logic and and. and uh, in our presentations, but when it comes to a spiritual life, um, well, logic and rational thought 
are still important, they can actually get in the way for me because yeah. um, it's hard for me to to incorporate the spiritual element into a rational construct. Yeah. Yeah, we get, get so sidetracked by how the typical norm is for what are interacting, even through COVID or not through COVID, how we interact with others and how the world goes around. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to step back and look at, hey, some of that normal worth thinking is normal, could actually be interfering with our, our spiritual walk and not even realizing it. Yeah, um, what, what you were talking about, uh, Christians needing to get back to the backstory. Yeah, if we're if we're blind to these influences, it's it's like we're a horse with blinders on, and we can't we can't see what's going on. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Sorry, it's okay. Phone's ringing, <laughs> and. Um, you know, um, some of these boxes we find ourselves in uh, actually hark back to traumas that have been experienced either by ourselves individually or the people we're interacting with or ethnic groups that we're interacting with yeah. or even entire generations. I you, I think of the, uh, the generation that lived through the Great Depression here in the United States where True. such a large part of our population was homeless and wandering around the land trying to find some source of security those people um, they 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 think differently than those of us who have never experienced that yeah and you know uh, that reminds me when when i did a census this past year i'm being quarter portuguese um, and doing a census and checking off boxes and stuff, I, I had to go on Google to kind of figure out what ethnicity I am. You know, <laughs> I know what my heritage is, but what terminology does that mean? Uh -huh. And, you know, it's interesting because I all of a sudden felt this weight come over me where, you know, I'm now falling into a group. I'm falling into a box. Whereas before I'm thinking to myself, no, I'm just, I'm just part of the part with everyone else. But no. I'm separate. Something's different with that. There's some history there, mm -hmm. you know, and I know my history. I, I'm not a no history major, but I know that there's been history issues with Portuguese in the past. And, you know, as I look at the current social events we have with uh, different situations happening, Black Lives Matter, and different scenarios where you have these different buckets. And it's, it's sad that we as, as, as a nation or as a world or as people have I've unfortunately grouped all this when really, according to God, we're just all one. And you know, it's just this is an interference, an interference method that has that has come into play. Yeah. Those those individual and group narratives create fear, distrust, bias, right. which then creates fear, distrust, bias, and the people that experience and interact with us. And then we develop coping mechanisms, which are really just band-aids to to make us feel better. They don't actually solve the problem. So, yeah, you know, like my my drone video I was showing with that little tree. You know, sure, I could have done a coping mechanism and gone and fought it with my controller, fighting the wind, fighting the offset enough that I could have probably gotten an okay shot. But when I've done it in the past, and often ended up in a tree. So, you know, like the guy going down the road, you know, and he swerves to avoid something. Next thing you know, he's going over here, going over here, going over here. He ends up in the ditch, mm -hmm. you know, overcompensating. And sure, we may want to think we're going to plow through this and we can do this on our own. We can we can achieve whatever we want to achieve. It doesn't always work that way. Yeah. And in certain circumstances, a coping mechanism can help us to make it through a difficult time period. But if we use that repeatedly and it becomes a habit, we become blind to the fact that we're using a coping mechanism. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, and then we don't understand why our lives are disrupted by that coping mechanism. Say denial. If denial yeah. is what we practice to cope, it, that can be really disruptive in our lives. But if we're doing it habitually, we don't even recognize what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. And then we've talked or talked in, uh, earlier this year about the physical effects that trauma and stress can have on us 
uh, in terms of changing us at the genetic level that we can pass on yeah. to our children and changing how our brains are structured, causing disease. Um, all of those things create obstacles or interference in our spiritual life. It's, yeah, it can. Um, and even outside of genetics, you know, even before I heard your your message on the whole genetic concept, which blew my mind, I, I never even heard that before. My assumption was more passed down in a form of communication or a form of interacting. You know, like when, when my father raised my dad and his father raised his dad and so on and so forth, that, that cascading effect. Uh, one example I have is, you know, the uh, the turkey at Thanksgiving. You know, I uh, heard a story where a lady would always cut her turkey in half to cook it for Thanksgiving. And finally, someone said to her, why do you do this? Exactly. And isn't this how you do it? She's thinking, <laughs> you know, come to find out after they, they conversed a little bit, she realized what was happening was it was passed down from her mother, passed down from her mother. This is how you do it because, well their stove wasn't large enough to put a full-size turkey in, you know? And you don't realize that. You don't realize that. Gra Grandma had to cut the turkey in half to get it into the stove. Yep. And so, uh, yeah, when you become blind to those coping mechanisms, which was really ingenious on Grandma's part, and now you have a big a big oven and you're still cutting the turkey in half. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and that makes me think of how uh, Jesus, when he healed the blind person, uh, one of the stories was the disciples came up to him and said, who made him blind? Did he or his parents? You know, and this is the whole, the world thought, the, the world mentality they had. They were stuck in this world perception that this is how they got sick. Mm. You know, there couldn't be any error. I mean, they didn't know about genetics. They didn't know about that stuff. There couldn't be no error. This had to be this way. Right. They were born blind. They were condemned. But no. There was a beauty on the other side of that. And Jesus had a mes message. Yeah. And, and I love that message. It's, it's almost as if he's saying, look, you're asking the wrong question. What, exactly. what you really need to be asking is, what's the answer? Yeah. And uh, the answer that he put forward is that this is a chance for God to demonstrate his power. Right. Um, his glory. So, well, I really appreciate you joining us today, Bobby. Thank you. Thank you. You have broadened our horizons, <laughs> lifted us up off the ground. So, okay. Enjoyed it. Okay. Enjoyed it. See you, Steve. Sure enough. And this is our last week um, exploring the GPS gospel. Um, <clears throat> if you find yourself drifting, or struggling with spiritual disorientation, discouragement, confusion, or just simply stuck in your spiritual walk, uh, consider some of the things that we've talked about. Perhaps it's time to explore some of the spiritual GPS systems that Christians find in the Bible or um, uh, test the possibility in your life of a personal relationship with God. A personal God who wants to interact with you and serve as a reference point in your life. Um, another another option is reaching out for mentorship to someone that you trust and admire. Um, or perhaps it can be just as simple as retracing the steps in your spiritual life to a point where you felt a strong connection, a strong sense of, of orientation, and starting restarting from that point, taking the next visible step. I've had to do all of these things at, at different points in my life. Okay, This is not Steve preaching. This is Steve sharing his journey. There's no shame here, no judgment. Just take the next visible step, because the one thing I can tell you is that there's always hope. You are not locked in a box. So in Southern Illinois this last week, COVID has continued to ramp up. We're seeing even more cases and um, um, yeah, but at the same time, there are signs of hope. The uh, Healthcare systems in Evansville and in Carbondale have recovered a little bit, despite the increase in cases. 
The hospital's uh, bed crunch has dissipated there. Hasn't done so much over in St. Louis. They're still struggling. Uh, which is all to say, my friends, be safe. Be prudent in your lives. But above all, look up. Thank you for joining. I'll see you again next week.